Susan Walsh was working hard to achieve her dreams. Ever since she'd been a little girl, she'd wanted to write, and after working in strip clubs and massage parlors throughout the 1980s, she'd put herself through college and completed her degree. It hadn't been easy, though. That was a difficult world for a young woman to maneuver through, and demons from her past and struggles with addiction had nearly derailed her life several times. Now, though, she was putting it all together. She was operating as a freelance journalist, raising a son with her estranged husband, and had been brought in by a writer she admired, who took her under his wing and helped mentor her. She was able to use her past life experiences to contribute to stories about the underbelly of the club scene she used to be a part of. Unfortunately, things would slowly take a steady turn downward, and after a letdown regarding an article she'd written, the end of her collaboration with her mentor, and the pressures of trying to provide for her son, Susan fell off the wagon and soon found herself working those same clubs, drinking and using drugs. Her friends saw the struggle and wanted to help, but by the time they tried, it would be too late. On July 16, 1997, Susan left her son with her ex-husband and walked down the street to make a call from a payphone. It was just a half a block away, but Susan was never seen again. In the ensuing investigation, detectives had struggles with exploring her double life, that of a devoted and loving mother, prim and proper by day, and a beautiful bleach-blonde stripper fighting off scores of men by night. What happened to Susan Walsh? Did she fall victim to someone in the gritty world she inhabited? Was she victimized by one of her ex-boyfriends, a stalker, her own estranged husband? Or did she, in desperation, leave everything behind to escape? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 68, The Vanishing of Susan Walsh. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the 1996 disappearance of 36-year-old Susan Walsh from Nutley, New Jersey. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances, examining a different case each Monday. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at traceevpod, on Instagram at traceevidencepod, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and much more. Trace Evidence is also on Patreon, so if you would like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence where you can get rewards such as stickers, pins, and commercial-free episodes. There's also a PayPal donation link on the website for those of you who don't wish to go through Patreon. This show is a complete one-man operation, and your support is greatly appreciated. This week we examine the mysterious disappearance of Susan Walsh. It's a complicated story, short on evidence and long on possibilities. This is episode 68, The Vanishing of Susan Walsh. Susan Young was born on February 18, 1960, in North New Jersey. Details about Susan's upbringing and childhood are extremely limited, though according to everyone who had information about this time in her life, it was far from a positive experience. Stories abound about what Susan endured as a youngster. There are whispers, hints, and suggestions, but few verifiable accounts. The most common statements about Susan's childhood imply the likelihood of growing up in a broken home, struggling in a situation where there was little money to provide for her, and sadly, there have been many who have suggested that Susan may have been the victim of sexual assault and molestation. 
The location of Susan's primary residence throughout the majority of her adult life will be in Nutley, a township in Essex County boasting a population of nearly 29,000 residents in just under three and a half square miles. Nutley sits just 30 miles to the southwest of New York City, and as such, many residents live in this area and make their commute across the bridges and through the tunnels to Manhattan for work on a daily basis. Despite an absence of information about Susan's childhood, there are certain details which we know for certain. Susan's father, Floyd Merchant, seemed by all accounts to have cared a great deal about his daughter and to have been one of the few bright spots in her youth. While Floyd tried to be a calming presence, certain things were beyond his control and ultimately, Susan would find herself self-medicating. Through the use of drugs and alcohol, Susan tried to balance out the chaos of her life, but as is often the case, the influence of these illicit substances soon began taking over completely. Addiction would be an issue that would always exist in Susan's life, even in those times where it seemed that she had beaten it. At a young age, Susan fell in love with writing. She found solace in putting her thoughts down on the page, and this would initiate a lifelong relationship with the written word. Beginning in poetry, Susan appreciated the ability to take all of the jumbled up and confused emotions and thoughts she had, transcribe them down onto the page, and in a way, exercise the demons that haunted her. Another outlet for Susan was dance, where she was said to have a nimble grace and tight control of her body and movements. There was an elegance to her, and she was said to almost float along rather than walking. Both writing and dance would become forever entwined, while simultaneously becoming two battling desires within Susan's heart. Growing up, Susan shaped into a beautiful young woman, one whom certainly had her fair share of male suitors, but for Susan, her interests were difficult to capture. She dreamed of more than the life she had experienced. She dreamed of being a writer living in a beautiful apartment overlooking Central Park while tending to her rock star husband. It was going to be a life of glitz and glam for the young woman, and for those who became entranced by her beauty, she certainly looked the part. Of course, for Susan's friends, it was all a fantasy, something they all told themselves, that they were going to break out of their little town and make it big to return someday with all the pomp and circumstance of someone returning for a visit with the success they knew they'd capture. However, when it came to Susan, she wasn't just dreaming. She was actually going to do something about it. Susan's battle with substance abuse would come and go throughout her late teens and early 20s. Hitting the local music clubs, as she loved to do, was not exactly helpful when it came to trying to avoid drugs and alcohol in the 1980s. Now, in her early 20s, Susan was walking a fine line between a functioning addict and completely off the wagon. Despite these issues, she managed to continue driving forward with her dreams. After graduating from high school in 1978, Susan went on to attend William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey. The campus of William Patterson was barely 10 miles from Nutley, and this provided Susan with the ability to save on tuition by living at home, though her finances were still a difficult situation. At William Patterson, Susan explored both dance and writing, pursuing courses in English and journalism. As anyone who's ever attended college knows, it's not a cheap endeavor. In order to help pay her way through school, the lithe young woman would take a job dancing at Show World Center in Times Square. Times Square of the 1980s was quite different from the cleaned-up tourist attraction it has since become, marked by hundreds of buildings offering exotic dancing, peep shows, pornography, and everything a lascivious mind could desire. Show World Center had opened in 1977 and was located at 669 8th Avenue. It quickly became the top destination for those seeking entrance into that world. It was here that Susan would spend her evenings working as both a dancer, clothed in a skimpy bikini, and also a stripper, bearing it all to help make her way through college. While this began as a means to an end, it was clear to many who knew Susan that this illicit world of sex, drugs, and fantasy called out to her in a way she would later find difficult to deny. In 
What had begun as a job would later become a way of life. A 24-hour non-stop party. Of course, Susan was not yet aware of all the darkness that could come when she entered this world. While attending college, Susan was elated to find herself invited to join the school's newspaper, The Beacon. This paper had won multiple awards and was considered amongst college newspapers rather prestigious. Being on the staff for the paper was a highly sought-after position, and Susan was well aware of her luck in having made the cut. A talented writer with a sharp mind and a keen eye for detail, she wasn't about to allow this opportunity to slip away. Being able to write for the Beacon gave Susan the first true taste of being a journalist, one which would only leave her hungry for more. However, before she could begin climbing the ladder as a journalist, Susan would meet a man fall in love, and then find herself at her lowest point yet. It was during her partying days that she would meet a man who, while not a star himself, had a connection to rock and roll royalty. Mark Walsh was, for the most part, an unassuming young man. He didn't look like the guy Susan was usually drawn to. He didn't sport tattoos and wild outfits. If nothing else, according to friends, Mark seemed rather boring which wasn't exactly Susan's cup of tea. Yet whatever Mark appeared to be, he had a connection which made him stand out. Mark's half-brother was Joe Walsh, legendary rocker and former lead singer of the Eagles. Some friends at the time recounted their introductions to Mark, finding themselves wondering if Susan was in love with the young man or if it was his connection to fame that she found so endearing. If nothing else, Susan had a way with men, an almost beguiling manner by which she was able to draw their focus and keep it. This served her well when she was up on the stage, moving for their entertainment, though some would disagree with that assessment. Susan's future writing mentor, James Ridgway, would describe Susan's time in the world of exotic dance, stating, quote, She was totally in control when she was on the bar dancing. She was in control of those men. She knew how to handle them. There was no question she was in control. End quote. Many of Susan's friends admired her power in this way and noted that she often had multiple men pursuing her at once. From powerful members of the music industry to rich businessmen, there wasn't anyone Susan couldn't charm. Glenn Kenny, a former friend of Susan's, talked deeply about how Susan was this brilliant and talented young woman who was vastly aware of her own sexuality and the way men saw her. It was Kenny's belief that Susan turned the tables on those she danced for, seeing it not so much as exploiting herself, but instead, utilizing her beauty to exploit the men instead. Despite the vast crowds of money-throwing men who would hunger for Susan, there was only one who could have her. In 1984, when Susan was 24 years old, she found herself deeply involved with Mark, and soon, would make the choice to accept his proposal. Before the end of the year, she would be his wife. While 1984 was a year filled with highs, it was also a year with a devastating low. As winter came blasting into the northeast, Susan found herself slowly approaching rock bottom. Her abuse of alcohol and drugs was taking over, and on Christmas Eve she'd find herself on the wrong side of the law. While this was a terrible thing for Susan, it may have also become a shining light for hope, for the realization of how far she'd fallen helped wake her up to the necessity to put her life back together. Susan's father, Floyd, discussed her arrest, stating, quote, On Christmas Eve, 1984, Susan called me from jail and said she'd been picked up for possession, and we were able to put together enough to pay the bail, and we got her out of jail. I took her home to our house, and that was the last drink or drug she had for quite a number of years. End quote. Susan successfully completed two months in a rehab program and, upon her release, was clean and sober and looking forward to leaving the past behind. While in rehab, Susan was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Soon, she would tackle that as she had tackled everything else with vim and vigor and would find a new meaning for her life. Ready to complete her education and begin forging pathways into her new drug and alcohol-free life, Susan came out of the gate swinging. 
Her focus had sharpened, and she was determined to make it in the world as a writer, leaving behind the dirty floors and gritty crowds of the club she had danced in the past. The brightest spot of Susan's life, though, would come along in 1985 when she gave birth to a son, David. David would quickly become Susan's sole focus, and it was her determination to ensure that her son was raised in a home much better than the one she herself had experienced. Between her newly found sobriety and her son, Susan found all of the inspiration she would need to make it. In 1988, she graduated from William Patterson with a bachelor's degree. It wasn't long before she began getting to work in the field of journalism. Susan began writing for trade magazines, including highly detailed and complex pieces for mechanical engineering. She was beginning to make a name for herself, but her concept of what being a writer was didn't exactly align with the realities of that career. James Ridgway later explained Susan's view, stating, quote, Her whole idea was to become a writer, and she had this kind of romantic idea of what a writer was. End quote. For many writers, it isn't a glamorous job. Money can be tight, paycheck can be few and far between, and if one wants to truly make it, that person has to be willing to struggle at the bottom and work their way up. Interestingly, it would be through her former profession as an exotic dancer that Susan would finally start to make her own way into the world of journalism. Screw Magazine was, for lack of a better description, a tabloid magazine focused on pornography. Run by Al Goldstein and Jim Buckley, the magazine was popular amongst heterosexual men and had its fair share of controversy, being involved in multiple court cases revolving around obscenity. The magazine, which referred to itself as Entertainment for Men, gave a startling look into the environment of sex work, the growing world of home video pornography, and many other facets, all adorned with tantalizing photos. Susan had been a part of that world and, as such, had a great deal of insight into it. Not to mention, she still had contacts who continued to operate in the clubs and bars, and thus found herself with a good foundation for writing about the life she had once been a part of. Around this time, Susan entered a graduate program at New York University, focused on achieving a master's degree. She was balancing out school, a son, and marriage, though the latter wasn't exactly going according to plan. Susan's father, Floyd, didn't think too highly of his son-in-law, Mark, and felt that his daughter was carrying too much of the weight and responsibility saying, quote, The whole time Susan and Mark were together, Susan was the breadwinner, and Susan worked like the Dickens trying to bring home the bacon. End quote. It was clear that things between Susan and Mark weren't going well. Sharing a home located at 32 Washington Street in Nutley, the marriage slowly deteriorated, and soon their separation occurred. The exact timing of Susan and Mark's separation is difficult to ascertain as... Due to financial necessity, they continued to live in the same building. Susan occupied the upstairs apartment and Mark the downstairs. Their relationship wasn't exactly kind and friendly, but it wasn't bitter and embattled either. They shared custody of David and, if nothing else, kept things civil for his sake. Now, without a second income and operating predominantly as a single mother, times were tough. I should note there is some debate about how much involvement Mark had in David's life at this time, both in terms of relationship and financial support. Some have presented the angle that Susan took on the full brunt of it all, essentially supporting David on her own, while others have argued it was more of a 50-50 split. Either way, it wasn't long before Susan found herself seeking out alternative options for bringing home a greater share of money. If for nothing else... David, whom Susan viewed as her entire world, needed that support. Susan's close friend and former co-worker, Melissa Hines, explained, quote, Susan's son came first in her life. He was like the number one priority. Susan was a great mother. She loved her son so much, she did anything for him. Every chance she had, she would spend time with her son. End quote. In 1994, at the age of 34, Susan had her first big break. James Ridgway, a writer for The Village Voice, was looking to write a book which would explore working in the sex industry. 
What he really wanted to write was a book about this topic from the point of view of those who worked in it, but he found getting information was difficult and those he tried to interview were disinterested, to say the least. Ridgway later explained, quote, I had a really hard time finding anybody to help me. I mean, the people I approached were very leery. They didn't want to do it. End quote. Seeking someone who might be able to help, Ridgway reached out to Al Goldstein of Screw Magazine, who put him in touch with Susan. Susan was excited to begin working, believing that this could be the first of many steps, which would lead her to finally becoming a full-fledged working journalist. At the same time, this positive turn of events may also have led to her downfall. The first collaboration between Susan and Ridgway was an August 1994 article published in the Village Voice. It was an expose about the recent arrival of Russian dancers, brought to the United States under the promise of working for operas and plays, but instead turned into strippers and forced under the thumb of the Russian mafia to dance and perform sex acts to survive. This brought Susan back down into the gritty underbelly of a world she had once escaped. She threw herself into it, going undercover to the clubs, talking to the girls, trying to gather information. This was certainly a dangerous task necessitating that Susan rub elbows with some violent criminals who were involved in this trade which, in today's terms, we would call sex trafficking. Ridgway, though, found Susan's work ethic incredible, later saying, quote, She was the most dependable person I ever worked with. Whenever she said she was going to do something, she did it. If it was hard to find somebody, she'd go find them. She never failed. Ever. End quote. Over the course of the next two years, Susan would work closely with Ridgway. She did reconnaissance for his book, infiltrating strip clubs, sometimes working there in order to gather information. While she's ultimately credited in Ridgway's book, entitled Red Light, as a research associate, she also slowly became one of the featured sex workers in the book. Black and white photos depict Susan, dressed in a small bikini, sometimes less, surrounded by groups of lecherous men reaching out for her. It was her drive and passion for journalism and her desire to work hard for Ridgway which slowly began to pull her back down into this world. At first, it seemed, she had everything under control, but as time passed, Susan's grip was slipping. In 1995, Susan was given the opportunity to write her own article for The Voice, Inspired by a recent news story about blood being stolen from a New York City hospital, Susan was asked to see what she could find out. The rumor mill had spun quite a tale. People, believing themselves to be vampires, were gathering in late-night clubs of fixing their teeth with fake fangs and, in some cases, having their teeth filed to resemble fangs. This group were allegedly behind the blood thefts and spent their nights drinking this blood, sometimes stolen from hospitals, sometimes by piercing one another's skin. It was Susan's job to get into these clubs, find out what was going on, and to write a comprehensive expose about it. Unfortunately, things wouldn't exactly pan out. Susan found the clubs to be little more than role play. Sure, there were some who were much more into it than others, and there were definitely those who believed themselves to actually be vampires, but these are the kinds of people who also find themselves flocking to a club where this fantasy could be entertained. As someone fully knowledgeable about selling fantasy, Susan wasn't all that surprised. For the most part, she found herself in dimly lit clubs with newly popular techno music thumping through the speakers while she watched people clad in leather, collars, spikes, drinking red wine from dirty glasses while living out the fantasy of being one of the undead. Many of these same individuals would wake up early during the week to tend to their real lives, going to work, coming home, and living as normal citizens until the next weekend where they could once again pretend to be something more. Susan wrote an expose, though she took a different angle on it. Rather than being a hit piece or some deeply colorful examination of the subculture itself, it came across more as a sympathetic piece. Susan identified with the desire to hide from reality to take on an alternate personality and to live as a normal woman during the day and something else by night. She was a single mother and exotic dancer, a dichotomy which she found paralleled the so-called vampire culture. She found them harmless, innocent, 
and simply looking for an escape. While these clubs had obtained reputations for being violent and sinister, this was partially due to the attendees helping to propagate that reputation. They enjoyed the idea that they were feared. They found entertainment and power in knowing that others thought they could be dangerous. Ultimately, Susan found no connection between the clubs and the stolen blood, and much to her disappointment, the village voice chose not to run the article. It was heartbreaking for Susan, to say the least. It was around this time that she began getting more involved in dancing again. She had reintroduced herself to that world, and this time, it would be more difficult to escape. It was easy money, and while the environment might not have been the best, Susan wanted to support her son and make a better life. Jill Morley, a friend of Susan's who danced alongside her and later made a film about the life of strippers, explained, quote, There's a saying for dancers that you use it until it starts to use you. I think she was able to use it, but it was really penetrating her a lot more, because from what I saw, some of her writing and her work, it was upsetting to me, because I could tell she was really getting hurt, and for me, when that point happened, I started getting out. Easier said than done. End quote. By the summer of 1996, Susan was deeply involved in the world of sex work. She worked at strip clubs, dabbled in operating in massage parlors, and even had become involved in some light sadomasochistic shows. Others have said she went beyond that. In addition to this, some of Susan's closest friends began seeing signs indicating that she may have been using again. She had been sober for 11 and a half years, but now, whether it was the stress of her finances, her struggle with being a single mother, or just a matter of being around it in those clubs a little too much, Susan fell off the wagon. Friend Melissa Hines later explained, quote, I know that she had had a previous addiction. I didn't see that side of Susan at all. I'd never seen her drink. I'd never seen her smoke a cigarette. But she did slip, and I became suspicious about it. End quote. Whether as a result of the lifestyle, the drugs, loneliness, or some combination of all three, Susan also began dating men who didn't necessarily have her best interests at heart. According to friends, she often found herself in situations with men where they were possessive or even obsessive. Stalking, which is always a worry for women working in this trade, became a real threat at this time. Susan spoke openly about believing some of her clients were following her and keeping tabs on her. In one instance, just weeks before her disappearance, one of these men showed up at her home. He'd followed her there and was knocking on the door. It was unsettling, to say the least. This was hardly an isolated incident, and Lieutenant John Rhine of the Nutley Police Department would later state, quote, She made several reports that she felt she was being followed and stalked by males she had met at strip clubs. Susan often dated people she had met in strip clubs. There were several reports some of her male friends were very possessive of her. End quote. One friend slash boyfriend was Christian Peppo, a 21-year-old who had spent a lot of time around Susan and whom she felt she could trust. Peppo lived in the apartment with Susan and stood in as a babysitter when necessary. According to friends, Susan would often leave her son with Peppo when she went to work or to a meeting. Mark was an option, but during the times where he was unavailable, Peppo was a good stand-in. Susan thought he got along well with David and that Peppo legitimately cared about her and her son. It was a good relationship for both, with Peppo having a place to stay and Susan having someone to help her when times were tough. Of course, Peppo's place in Susan's life inspired a certain level of jealousy as well. Many of the men who were obsessed with Susan viewed Peppo as a blockade in the road, and there were multiple police reports involving men assaulting Peppo, sometimes at Susan's home, in some form of misdirected retribution. In June of 1996, one month before Susan would vanish, Ridgway's book Red Light was published, and there was a book launch party hosted at a club known as Sally's Hideaway in New York City. For many present, Susan was very positive and happy, but it was clear that she wasn't clean. Several friends noted that Susan had been drinking that night, and they believed she'd begun abusing the prescription drug Xanax 
She made various statements at the party, telling people that she was scared for her life, that the CIA and the Russian mob wanted to kill her. At the time, friends thought this was just paranoia, or the result of being intoxicated. But a month later, these same friends would begin to wonder if there was any legitimacy behind Susan's paranoia. Some friends made note of Susan's physicality at the time, noting the appearance of what seemed to be self-inflicted wounds, perhaps an early sign of self-harm and possible suicidal urges. This wouldn't necessarily be uncommon for someone suffering from bipolar disorder who is abusing drugs and alcohol. July 16, 1996 was a blistering hot summer day in Nutley. Temperatures climbed to 98 degrees and the humidity was nearly unbearable. Susan sat in her apartment with David, now 11 years old, and was making plans for the day. The 36-year-old walked past a calendar hanging on the wall, with appointments, jobs, and all manner of information written onto it. Peppo was in the bedroom, sleeping. At approximately 12 p.m., Susan led David downstairs to Mark's apartment and knocked on the door. She needed to make a phone call, and she needed Mark to look after David for the day. She couldn't afford a phone, so she frequently used a payphone located down the street. Mark had a phone, which he often allowed Susan to use, but he would only let her use the phone if she could tell him exactly who she was calling. He didn't want calls to unsavory characters showing up on his bill and possibly tying him to something he didn't want to be involved with. On this particular afternoon, Susan exited the building and picked up the phone. Who she called and what it was in reference to, to this day, remains unknown. That particular payphone at the time did not have a system in place monitoring where calls were made to, and so later, investigators were unable to ascertain the nature of this call. Mark will later tell police that Susan said she needed to call her manager, the man who booked her in clubs, but there may have been an ulterior motive for this call. Many of Susan's friends, such as Melissa, who had begun to suspect she was using again, believed that her manager may have played a role in selling her drugs. Mark's interaction with Susan will be the last completely verified sighting of the young mother. In a tragic twist, on this very same day, Susan's friend Melissa was on the phone with a mutual friend. The two discussed the possibility that Susan may have fallen off the wagon, and they decided to organize an intervention. They wanted to confront Susan, talk to her about her issues, and do what they could to offer a helping hand. Unfortunately, neither of these friends will ever speak to or see Susan again. Melissa picked up her phone and dialed Susan's beeper. Not having a phone in her apartment, Susan would usually receive calls on her beeper and then call them back on the payphone across the street minutes later. On this particular day, Susan did not call Melissa back. After several beeps and no response, Melissa decided to drive over and check up on her friend at approximately 3 p.m. Upon arriving, Melissa had an uncomfortable feeling she couldn't quite explain. She approached the door and knocked, but received no response. Melissa found the situation odd because, when she was home, Susan usually left one of her doors open and in the sweltering summer heat, always had her windows open. However, on this day, the doors were both locked and the windows were shut. Susan didn't have a car, so it wasn't possible to know if she was home simply by looking in the driveway. After 15 minutes, Melissa left, figuring that Susan must have been out somewhere, but she planned to return later to check again. Approximately an hour passed before Melissa returned and it was now about 4 p.m. She once again knocked and banged on the door, she called out Susan's name, but again received no answer. She didn't hear any sounds inside, nor did she see movement in the windows. Around this same time, Mark's car pulled up to the curb, and he stepped out with David. The two had been down at a local store picking up school supplies for the upcoming year. Melissa asked both if they had seen Susan, or if they knew where she might have been, but Mark explained that she had dropped David off to make a phone call, and neither had seen her since around 12 o'clock. Unable to do anything and unsure of where Susan might be, Melissa had no choice but to return home. She continued paging Susan throughout the rest of the day and night. Around 6 p.m., Melissa received a phone call from Joey, 
a mutual friend between she and Susan. Joey was at Susan's place looking to give her a ride to work. Since she didn't have a car, she often caught rides with friends or hired drivers when she could afford to. According to Joey, he had arrived around 5 p.m. as they had previously arranged, but Susan was nowhere to be found. She didn't answer her door, and the apartment appeared to be vacant. Joey sat in his car waiting on Susan until nearly 6 p.m. before he finally got frustrated and drove off, assuming Susan either found another way to work or was out doing something else. At this point, no one knew where Susan was, but there was nothing to indicate a problem either. It was unlike Susan to not respond to pages and to fail to show up for a ride to work, but if she was getting back into drugs, it wouldn't be all that unlikely she could have gone with someone for a fix. 24 hours would pass since the last time Susan was seen, and at 12.15pm on July 17th, Mark placed a call to the Nutley Police Department to report Susan missing. After the call, the Nutley Police dispatched an officer to the home to gather information, and before he arrived, Mark called Melissa and explained to her that Susan hadn't returned home, no one knew where she was, and so he'd called the police. When investigators arrived, they interviewed both Mark and David trying to gather as much information as they could. They were then granted access to Susan's apartment and began poring over it looking for clues. What they found inside didn't make a great deal of sense to them. On the kitchen table was Susan's purse, wallet, ID, pager, and her bipolar medication. Various personal items were spread out across the table, and it certainly didn't appear that if Susan left, that she was planning to go very far. Mark had explained Susan was going to make a call, and the items left behind seemed to indicate that wherever Susan had gone, it couldn't have been far, and she must have been planning to return. Investigators didn't find anything in the apartment which would suggest that a crime had taken place. There were no signs of a struggle or traces of blood. There was nothing really at all. Other than Susan's personal effects, it appeared as though she had left the apartment of her own volition. Quickly, authorities began considering the possibility of foul play, and in hopes of finding Susan, they started gathering information about the people in her life. Being that Susan ran in such wide circles, from dancers to bikers to writers, it's difficult to know exactly where to start. The first person they tracked down was Christian Peppo. According to Lieutenant Ryan, there was nothing in Peppo's statements or behavior which made them believe he had any knowledge of Susan's whereabouts. In his interview, Peppo explained that he'd been asleep that afternoon when Susan had woken him. She'd explained she was going to make a phone call and she'd be back, though she didn't say who she was calling. And when Peppo left the apartment at approximately 1.30, an hour and a half later, Susan hadn't returned yet. Peppo does, however, mention to authorities a name, Billy Walker. According to Peppo, Walker was an ex-boyfriend of Susan's who had threatened her life and was stalking her. In the weeks leading up to her disappearance, he alleges that Walker had beeped Susan multiple times and called asking for her at different clubs. Peppo went further, asserting that Susan had connections to known mafia associates and that she discussed the possibility of having them get rid of Walker, though Peppo alleges he warned her that the mafia associates would be just as likely to get rid of her, too. When police spoke with Melissa, she explained that Susan had recently been having issues with an ex-boyfriend. Melissa told authorities that the ex had become obsessive, and she'd brought Susan down to the police department to fill out the paperwork for a restraining order. Lieutenant Ryan later confirmed that there were in fact restraining orders in effect at the time of her disappearance, but that, despite their efforts, they were unable to find any evidence that those orders had been violated. Whether or not Walker is the same ex-boyfriend against whom Susan was seeking a restraining order has never been confirmed. Detectives canvassed the area around Susan's apartment, hoping to find someone who had seen her in the previous 24 hours. While they came across many individuals who had seen her in the past or who knew her directly, they found only a few who claimed to have seen Susan the day she vanished. Only one of those accounts has ever been granted any validity. Across the street from Susan's building was a pizza parlor, and according to one of the employees, 
Sometime after 12 p.m. on the 16th, he had looked out the window and seen Susan going back into the building after using the phone. While this eliminated the possibility that Susan may have been abducted while walking to or from the phone, it does little to shed light on what may have happened or where she could have went. With few clues and no real leads, investigators began turning their focus towards those closest to Susan. The two names which initially received the most attention were live-in boyfriend Christian Peppo and estranged husband Mark Walsh. While both men were considered possible suspects, there was little to no evidence to show either was involved and both had been very cooperative with authorities. Lieutenant Ryan later explained, quote, At the beginning, Mark was considered a possible suspect. Mark was cooperative. He gave us access. We never gathered any information to really implicate him in any wrongdoing. Christian was also looked at. He did come in to cooperate, and once again, as a result of what we found, we had no reason to believe at the time that he was involved in any wrongdoing. End quote. With no leads, no real suspects, and no clues, authorities worked the case but could find nothing to work with. Flyers were printed up and distributed bearing Susan's image, description, and last known whereabouts. Tips were called in, but almost all led to dead ends. While friends and families couldn't necessarily agree on what may have occurred, they did all share one common belief. Susan loved her son more than anything and would never have walked away from him of her own volition. More than a month after Susan was last seen, police received a call from a woman located in Newark who wished to discuss Susan's disappearance. The woman, who requested that authorities keep her identity anonymous, had an interesting story to tell. According to her, she had met Susan in Newark where she worked as a sex worker and she claimed Susan was operating in the same business. She claimed to have allowed Susan to live with her for a period of two weeks, and that following that time, she hadn't seen Susan since. Authorities felt this was a valid scenario, as the woman was able to provide information about Susan, which had not been printed in local newspapers. She knew that Susan had a son, and lived in the same building as her ex-husband. According to this witness, Susan had said she left her son behind and that if authorities found her and brought her home, she would end her own life. While authorities thought this was a possibility, friends did not. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe that if Susan had the ability, that she wouldn't come home to her son. Melissa actually met with the witness and felt that the story didn't make any sense and she was unconvinced that the witness had ever even met Susan. It should be noted that in some interviews, Melissa alleged to have seen Susan getting into a car with two men after the time she vanished. Melissa took down the license plate number and gave it to authorities. According to investigators, the owner was tracked down and when asked if Susan had been in his car, he said it was possible, but he really didn't know for sure. Another dead end. The media grabbed a hold of Susan's story and the number of tips coming in increased dramatically. Investigators were fielding calls from individuals from all walks of life, but many of them told the same story, that Susan was living on the streets, selling her body for food and drugs, and that she was not coping well with her slide back down into addiction. Her shame, her fear, and her need for the drugs were causing her to run from everyone in her life, including the son she loved so deeply. These accounts are predominantly from people who claim to have seen Susan since she disappeared, though there is little information delivered to help detectives track her down. According to Lt. Ryan, officers were sent to nearly every strip club in New Jersey and some in New York, hoping to try and track down anyone who might have had information about Susan. Many people claim to have known Susan, and some even alleged to have seen her within recent days. Ryan later stated, quote, it always seemed like we were just one step behind this woman. You could never get close enough to confirm or deny that it was Susan. I would say that, well, over a dozen people were able to pick Susan's picture out of a lineup in an array of six different faces, and without a doubt, point to Susan and say she was here just hours ago. End quote. During their investigation, police came across Jill Morley, Susan's friend, 
former dancer and now documentary filmmaker, Morley was working on a film entitled Stripped, which explored the lives of strippers both on and off the stage. Susan had been a part of this documentary, and Morley turned over all of her footage, which included interviews with Susan. These interviews granted insight into Susan's state of mind at the time. One interview was filmed just two days before Susan vanished. Morley describes Susan as being bubbly and friendly for the interview, but that she felt Susan seemed to be exhausted and strained. In the interview, Susan says, quote, I just recently started drinking and lost 11 and a half years of sobriety because of dancing, because it just got too painful. End quote. During the interview, Susan's beeper went off and she remarked, quote, That's my beeper. It's probably a stalker right now. I do. I do have a stalker. End quote. For investigators, that particular statement grabbed their attention. As months began passing, more people started opening up about Susan's dangerous lifestyle. Jill Morley expressed believing that Susan was being stalked and that she tried to warn her about putting herself in risky situations. Authorities started digging through Susan's writing, trying to determine if it was possible that she had been targeted due to one of the articles she'd written or her involvement in Ridgway's book. In response to this, friends and family began going to clubs trying to find out what they could about Susan's reputation amongst the club crowd, from sex clubs and strip clubs to the vampire clubs Susan had infiltrated. One thing which they all tended to believe was that while Susan had worked so hard to investigate and write about this life, it was clear that she had lost herself in it in the process. While rumors circulated about Susan being targeted by the Russian mafia, stalked by members of an underground vampire club, or perhaps even subjected to abduction or murder by an ex-boyfriend or obsessed stalker, police were unable to tie any of these theories to reality. When all was said and done, a year had passed, and for investigators, the most likely scenario was that Susan had fallen back into the world of addiction, found herself in the company of dangerous individuals looking to prey on her in her weakened state, and that she had either been forcibly moved into sex work or had elected to leave her life behind and fully succumb to her addiction. Lieutenant Ryan explained, quote, It was my opinion that, for whatever reason, she had chosen to leave her life behind. To this day, I still hope that she is alive. However, honestly, I don't know what happened to Susan. End quote. Friends and family were frustrated, believing that someone had abducted or murdered Susan. It was their belief that authorities had dismissed her case, finding that the world she was involved in made her less worthy of investigation. As is often the case, sex workers and those operating in the world of adult entertainment, especially those suffering from addiction issues, are often marginalized by law enforcement and given less attention and urgency than other similar cases involving those who are not in that industry. Lieutenant Ryan emphatically denied that, explaining that he exhaustively searched for Susan, spent countless hours going from club to club and bar to bar, interviewing hundreds of individuals in a desperate search for Susan, but that she simply couldn't be located. Nine years would pass before there was any movement on Susan's case. In 2005, Lieutenant Steve Rogers became the lieutenant commander of the Nutley Police Department, and for him, his top priority was to reopen cold cases and try to shed new light on old mysteries. Susan's case was the first that Rogers reinvestigated, and he believed that by re-examining the evidence, introducing a new line of questioning to friends and family, and injecting new life into Susan's case, they might be able to find some new leads. While going over the evidence which had accumulated during the initial investigation, Rogers made a discovery which had been previously missed. Among the items gathered from Susan's apartment and logged into evidence was her calendar. Susan kept meticulous records of meetings, appointments, names, and locations on this calendar. Every month was splashed with information. Fascinatingly, Susan had vanished in July of 1996, and one page was missing from her calendar, apparently torn out. 
the page depicting July of 1996. This made Rogers suspicious, as he felt it was highly likely that if indeed Susan had become someone's target, there was a good chance the suspect may have taken this page of the calendar in order to conceal his name, location, or other information which investigators may have been able to use to track him down. At the same time, Rogers found it perplexing as he couldn't understand why this person wouldn't simply have taken the entire calendar. Following up on this, Rogers wanted to see the apartment again and examine the scene. When he arrived at the building, he found Mark still lived there, but in the nearly 10 years that had passed, Mark had moved on and no longer wished to be involved. Rogers was denied a conversation and entry to the building to conduct a search for forensic evidence, and just a few days later, received a phone call from Mark's attorney requesting that any further conversation with his client be conducted through his office. When asked about this, Rogers explained, quote, To this day, why he did that, I don't know, because there was a point in time where he was volunteering information every single day. End quote. Despite this, Rogers doesn't believe this implies guilt on Mark's part, but more likely that Mark wanted to leave the past behind and not reopen old wounds. As the years have continued to pass, Susan's name has slowly faded from the spotlight. Once the talk of Nutley, the mystery that captivated locals, it has become a niche case which few discuss and even fewer are aware of. However, the investigation has continued. In an interview, Lieutenant Commander Rogers expressed that they had found a new piece of evidence which pointed them in a new direction and made them believe this was absolutely a homicide. What the nature of this evidence is has yet to be revealed in order to protect the integrity of the case. But Rogers explained it by saying, quote, Looking at this with a fresh set of eyes reveals a set of facts that's very troubling. I'm confident we'll get to the bottom of this. End quote. In 2006, ten years after Susan's disappearance, investigators discussed using sonar to search for Susan's body in a reservoir located in Montclair, just four miles from Nutley. Most interestingly, this reservoir was located in an area where Susan used to walk to clear her mind, and even more interestingly, the reservoir sits not very far at all from the back of a home owned by Mark Walsh's father. In a case spanning more than 20 years, there are a great many questions and few, if any, answers. Over that time, multiple theories have been suggested, and the majority of those theories revolve around three possibilities. The first theory suggests that Susan's disappearance was not the result of an ex-boyfriend, obsessive stalker, or anyone other than Susan herself. Many believe the desperate and depressed single mom fell victim to her addictions, and in her darkest moments, either elected to leave her life behind to give in completely to those addictions, or perhaps even made the choice to end her own life. Susan's bipolar disorder is believed to have possibly played a major role in that behavior. The second theory follows the line of thought that Susan's disappearance may have been tied to her work as a journalist, perhaps due to having exposed an operation run by dangerous individuals. Some believe this could point a finger towards the Russian mafia who were operating in sex trafficking while others believe someone from the so-called vampire subculture may have felt resentful of Susan's infiltration. The third and final theory explores the possibility that Susan may have indeed fallen victim to a crime, but that rather than having been conducted by someone who was desperate to get close to her, it may have been perpetrated by someone who was already close to her. For many, the finger points towards her estranged husband, Mark Walsh, while investigators have dismissed Mark as a suspect, their actions regarding the Montclair Reservoir have raised suspicions about what they truly believe. Others speculated about Christian Peppo, or former boyfriend, Billy Walker. When last seen, Susan Walsh was described as being a Caucasian female, standing 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighing approximately 110 pounds. 
She had bleached blonde hair and blue eyes. It is unknown what she was wearing the day she disappeared, though she was known to wear a gold ring with a black stone. Susan has a scar on her right wrist, smoked cigarettes at the time, and speaks with a pronounced New Jersey accent. It's been nearly 23 years since Susan Walsh vanished from the streets of Nutley, New Jersey, leaving behind all of her personal effects, her friends, family, and her beloved son. David, 11 at the time his mother vanished, will turn 33 this year, just three years younger than Susan was the last time she was seen. The apartment building in which they lived hasn't changed a great deal, and while Nutley has seen its shape transformed in the past two decades, the streets and sidewalks Susan once strode down are still haunted with the ghosts of memory. The payphone Susan used slowly became a relic in the world of cell phones and was eventually decommissioned. Times Square, once the epicenter for men seeking strippers and sex workers, is now a tourist area dotted with cafes and corporate businesses pandering to visitors and locals alike. The memory of the area's gritty past of pornography and smut exists only in photographs and stories told by those who still remember. As much of the world has changed since the summer of 1996, the questions about Susan's life and disappearance remain, and for those who seek to know what happened, the truth has been elusive for far too long. This year, CrimeCon will be held in New Orleans from June 7th through the 9th. Amidst exciting presentations and inspiring discussions, I'm really looking forward to attending this year. I had such a great time last year. If you're planning to attend but haven't yet purchased your pass, you can save 10% by using the promo code TRACE19. Simply visit CrimeCon.com, select a standard pass, and use the code TRACE19. That's T-R-A-C-E-1-9 to save 10% today. I look forward to seeing you there. Susan Walsh's disappearance is incredibly frustrating and heartbreaking. The idea that this woman who had worked so hard to put her life together, to provide for her son, and to make her dream of being a journalist come true could simply vanish without a trace is overwhelming. When you dig into this case, it's easy to become lost in the sea of possible suspects, motives, and scenarios. With Susan running in so many different crowds, with such an eclectic assortment of friends and associates, it's almost impossible to know where to begin. When you factor in stalkers, obsessive clients, drugs and alcohol, and bipolar disorder, you've got a recipe for disaster. For investigators, it was nearly impossible to narrow down a place to even begin. While some will dismiss Susan as being unworthy of investigation due to the nature of her job, her descent into addiction, and the people with whom she surrounded herself, this stands as yet another reminder that regardless of how a person lives their life, there is value in it. And while some will quickly say that Susan put herself into a bad position, it should be remembered that this is someone's daughter, someone's friend, someone's mother. Good people can fall into bad spaces, make bad choices, follow bad roads. This doesn't deny them their humanity nor their right to justice. We don't know exactly what happened to Susan as a child, but whatever it was, it obviously stayed with her and contributed to her choices and addiction issues. No matter what someone may believe about her lifestyle, no one deserves to disappear. When you look at this case, you're mostly met with questions, dead ends, countless leads, and no evidence to truly follow up on. As is often the case with situations such as this, investigators, journalists, and true crime enthusiasts will construct theories to try and fill in the blanks, to try and answer the unknown. In Susan's case, we have three theories which tend to encompass all of the angles involved. The first of these theories was put forth by the original investigators on the case that Susan Walsh either elected to leave and live her life away from those she loved, or perhaps that she made the terrible choice 
to end her own life. It seems undeniable that in the weeks and months leading up to Susan's disappearance, she had fallen off the wagon and was once again drinking alcohol and taking drugs. The one drug named by friends was Xanax, though many believe she was using drugs other than prescription. For those who knew her, Susan's behavior became erratic, and she didn't seem like herself. Melissa Hines was so concerned that she tried to arrange an intervention to save Susan from herself. Unfortunately, that intervention was to take place on the very day that Susan vanished. Susan was back working in the strip club she had once detached herself from, surrounded by men who saw her as an object for their own pleasure rather than a human being. She worked hard, trying to bring home money for her son, to support him and provide him the upbringing she didn't have, but she slowly lost herself to that world, and in a way, her experience in the field of stripping was another addiction Susan struggled with. Living the fantasy, being the object of obsession, no matter what may have been going on in her life, these were places where she could go and know, without a doubt, that there would be people there who wanted her attention. For someone who felt the absence of love in her life, it isn't hard to imagine that this attention, no matter how synthetic or sexualized, could become fulfilling. Many of Susan's friends have discussed how easy it is to get lost in the world of being a stripper, and for Susan it was no different. She initially used it as the inspiration for articles, giving her opinion on it, exploring it, examining and analyzing each and every swaying step across the stage. But like everything else in life, too much of something is never a good thing, and in the months leading up to her disappearance, Susan had gone over the edge in more ways than one. Police spoke with multiple witnesses who claimed to have seen Susan after her disappearance, including close friend Melissa Hines. Whether it was operating as a sex worker, living on the streets, or dancing in clubs surrounded by dangerous men who ushered her from one place to another, it's difficult to believe that all of these sightings could have been wrong. At the same time, you're talking about a shapely, bleach blonde stripper working the mid 90s scene of New Jersey and New York. There was hardly a shortage of women who would fit that description. So the question really becomes would Susan have chosen to leave? Almost every single person who knew her says no. She loved her son, she cared far too much about him to just walk out one day. It's hard to know which could have been more controlling for Susan, her love for her son, or the drugs that were eroding her logical thoughts. Either way, even if Susan had made the choice to leave, against all evidence and theories to the contrary, there are details which simply don't make sense. If Susan was merely choosing to go elsewhere, to run off, why leave everything behind? Sure, perhaps she wouldn't take all of her furniture or all of her clothes, but she left everything. Money, clothes, medication, ID, pager. Perhaps someone who wanted to escape from life would have left all of these things, but it seems bizarre she'd have made the choice to do this, and rather than planning it out, just decided to do it one afternoon where she had to ask her estranged husband to watch her son so she could run away. At the same time, it's difficult to ascertain the thought process of someone who is suffering from addiction and bipolar disorder. There have been sightings of Susan, though never completely verified. No remains have ever been located, no evidence uncovered which directly ties anyone to Susan's disappearance with enough validity to result in the issuing of warrants or an arrest. Without enough to go on, police found it possible, considering the sightings, that Susan may have just run off. They didn't really have any answers as to why she chose that day or the fact that she'd left everything behind. It just seemed like the only lead that had any real information connected to it. So could Susan have just run off? Absolutely. But would she? Well, that's a different story. You can never truly know what's going on in someone's mind, but those who knew her best don't believe that for a second. Had Susan run off and was still out there operating as a sex worker, as many have alleged, you'd imagine she'd have been found by now. Considering all of the technological advances we've had in law enforcement, if Susan were arrested for solicitation, it wouldn't take long for her record to pop up on the computer screen showing exactly who she was. Of course, this has never happened. There hasn't been a sighting of Susan since the late 90s, and even those sightings can't be verified. 
It's hard to imagine that someone could stay hidden just 20 minutes outside of the town they disappeared from for more than 20 years and never get spotted or find the urge to pick up the phone and call home, especially if it was just to hear the voice of her beloved son. The streets can be a dangerous place, though, and we have to entertain the possibility that Susan could have run off on her own and later become victim to a crime and possible murder. Were that the case, the killer might not even know the true identity of the woman he murdered. Some believe Susan may have gone off and taken her own life, overwhelmed with falling back into drugs and alcohol, being back on the stage stripping for lecherous men and feeling that she'd lost sight of her dreams. Rumors about Susan's suicidal tendencies are difficult to navigate. There have been statements from some who suggest that Susan had attempted to take her own life in the past and that the scar on her wrist was a reminder of that attempt. A person suffering from bipolar, off her medication and consuming drugs and alcohol, could certainly fit into being considered a risk for harming herself. Again, though, the question would become, if Susan did commit suicide, where is she? It seems unlikely that her body wouldn't have turned up by now, and most people when committing suicide aren't overwhelmed with the desire to ensure they're never found. Of course, it's possible she could have gone into any number of bodies of water in the area, or perhaps the reservoir, and perhaps this explains why she hasn't been located. In terms of this theory, it's nearly impossible to rule either branch of it out, but for many who examine this case, Susan's disappearance being tied to a choice she made on her own seems like the least likely option. For most, it seems most probable that Susan was the victim of an abduction or homicide, and that leads us to our second theory. So if Susan wasn't responsible for her own disappearance, who could have been? For investigators and friends, it seemed likely that Susan may have been victimized by someone who was displeased with her work as an investigative journalist. During her time operating this double life, she was involved in multiple clubs, spent time around a great deal of unsavory characters, and even went so far as to dig into the activities of the Russian mafia. Suffice it to say, there's certainly a lot of people involved in the world of sex work who would much prefer that their activities remain secret. Firstly, Susan went back to working at strip clubs as a way of being able to give insight into that world. It seems unlikely that her connections to stripping would have led anyone to have a reason to want to lash out against her. There weren't a great deal of names given out during her investigation, and the book and articles written about that world were, if nothing else, more about the world itself than particular individuals. It's certainly possible someone could have felt slighted when they discovered what she was doing, and many others in this field did not want to discuss it, so perhaps they had reasons to be afraid. But when you weigh this against the other options, it doesn't seem like the most likely choice. Once Susan became involved with investigating the Russian Mafia's operation of bringing Russian dancers to the States and forcing them into stripping and sex work, that's certainly a point at which danger escalates. You're dealing with criminals who operate in sex trafficking at this point, and it's unlikely they'd hesitate to commit a murder to cover up their crimes. At the same time, it's likely not difficult for the trafficking to go both ways, and if they wanted to, abducting Susan or drugging her, and then sending her back to Russia, where she would be forced to work in their clubs and sex worker culture, isn't beyond comprehension. Some individuals have said that when they went around to the Russian clubs to ask about Susan, they were faced with aggressive and angry bouncers and club managers who didn't like them talking to the dancers. Could Susan have found herself on the opposite end of their anger? It's certainly a possibility. Even Susan's live-in boyfriend, Christian Peppo, has said that Susan not only knew figures associated with the mafia, but that she felt close enough to them that she considered them an option when it came to trying to get rid of a stalker. Peppo warned her not to involve herself with them, as they could eliminate her as well, but we simply don't know all the dynamics of those relationships. Either way, it isn't completely out of the realm of possibility to imagine she could have found herself targeted by them, either due to her journalism, her drug addiction leading to a debt, or someone just sick and twisted who had an obsession with her. And if the Russian mafia is looking to eliminate someone in a way in which they're never going to be found, 
they certainly have the skills and experience to get the job done. Outside of the Russian Mafia, many have examined Susan's investigation into the vampire clubs and consider this a likely source for her disappearance. It's certainly possible Susan could have spent time around dangerous individuals in this arena, but at the same time, she did little to expose or exploit them. In fact, she was rather protective and sympathetic towards them. This doesn't seem like the kind of journalism which would have raised the ire of a wannabe vampire. For the most part, the idea of the vampire clubs carries a certain sensationalism and drama to it. Sure, it seems exciting and almost movie-like that someone could fall into a club of so-called vampires and end up victim to their twisted rituals. But the reality of it is that this seems about as likely as anything else. It's more likely that Susan could have met someone through these clubs who was troubled, a criminal, or had violent tendencies, but the idea that there was some grand plot amongst a club of people wanting to eliminate Susan for exposing their vampire role-playing is a bit hard to swallow. Susan wrote a lot. She discussed all aspects of being a stripper, operating in sex work, dealing with mafia associates, wannabe vampires, sleazy managers, obsessive clients. It's impossible to rule out the idea that some of Susan's writings could have led to her disappearance, but the fact of the matter is, this is a possibility which, like almost everything else in this case, can neither be proven nor disproven. We simply don't know enough to say for sure, and if anyone spending time in these clubs knows more about Susan's disappearance, they certainly haven't been forthcoming about it. You'd think that 23 years later, there would at least be rumors, someone named, someone talking about it, and yet there's been nothing. So the idea that Susan's work led to her disappearance can be neither ruled in nor out, and remains only another possibility. The third and final theory explores a more logical possibility in Susan's disappearance. Whenever someone disappears, it's usually those closest to the individual who are most closely examined by investigators. In this case, that leads to three potential individuals, Christian Peppo, Billy Walker, and Susan's estranged husband, Mark Walsh. Beginning with Peppo, he seems like the least likely factor in this case. No evidence was ever found to suggest his involvement in Susan's disappearance, and beyond that, no one really listed him as someone they thought would have been involved either. He was more than cooperative with investigators, gave much information as he could, and even pointed a finger towards Walker, whom he believed they needed to look more closely at. Really, the only detail that connects Peppo to Susan the day she vanished is the fact that he was in the apartment that afternoon. According to Peppo, he'd been sleeping when Susan woke him to say she was going to use the phone and she'd return. She never did, and later Peppo hopped a bus into Manhattan as he often did. Knowing that Susan dropped David off with Mark around 12, and that Peppo was on the bus bound for New York City at 1.45, that would leave him less than two hours to somehow incapacitate Susan and conceal her in a location that has remained hidden for more than 20 years. As you may have guessed from the fact that Peppo took the bus, he didn't have a car, so he had no way that he could have transported Susan. Not to mention the fact that whatever occurred would likely have had to have happened in her apartment, and other than her personal effects being scattered on her kitchen table, there was nothing to suggest any kind of struggle or crime had taken place. Peppo pointed towards Billy Walker, a former boyfriend of Susan's who was involved in the drug trade and had his own connections to the mafia. Rumors abound about Walker, everything from him being a low-level crack dealer to assisting the mafia with the elimination of bodies. The truth of the matter is, we really don't know much of anything about Walker, other than the fact that he was apparently obsessed with Susan called repeatedly looking for her, paged her endlessly, and may or may not have been the subject of a restraining order. Considering the shady nature of Walker's activities, it isn't difficult to imagine authorities would likely have been familiar with him and his record, and would have worked hard to try and draw a connection to Susan's disappearance. The problem with Walker really is that investigators couldn't find anything. Yes, he had allegedly been stalking Susan and she was frightened of him, but that's about it. They couldn't place him in Nutley that day, they couldn't secure the knowledge that he'd been involved, and they never found anyone who could give them anything solid to implicate him. Peppo pointed to him, but as we are aware, 
There was a large circle of men who wanted Susan's attention, and it's not impossible that there could have been a dispute between the two over Susan. That doesn't mean either one of them was involved. Of course, it doesn't mean either one of them's innocent either. Yet another possible suspect with little to no evidence to support it. Most people believe Walker was a dangerous, violent drug dealer and abuser, but if he was, he somehow managed to commit the perfect crime. In all reality, Walker is sort of a template for any possible suspect. A possibly violent and dangerous person who was obsessed with Susan. That description fits a lot of people who were in her life. That leads us back to Mark, Susan's estranged husband. It isn't uncommon for a spouse, or a strange spouse in this case, to be the number one target for suspicion from investigators. Early on, the Nutley Police Department worked closely with Mark before finally turning their investigation towards him. However, from the onset, Mark was exceedingly cooperative. He's the one who called in the missing persons report in the first place. He allowed investigators to access not only Susan's apartment, but his own. He called in tips. He checked in with investigators daily and later weekly. According to detectives working the case, Mark was highly involved and active in trying to help them figure out what may have happened. On the one hand, some view this as a sign of his innocence. On the other, there are those who believe he tried to steer the investigation away from himself. It's not uncommon for a killer to try and involve himself in a case, but at least in this instance, it's hard to say one way or the other. Investigators have never listed Mark as a suspect and have actually been quite defensive of him. Even Steve Rogers, who reopened the case a decade later, wasn't all that upset about the fact that Mark no longer wished to cooperate. Perhaps the man had dealt with it, come to terms with it, and wanted to move on with his life. Remember, he had custody of their son, and perhaps he wanted to protect him from the stories, the questions, the police, and anyone else who might want to bring the spotlight back onto this case. Perhaps he had other reasons that we may never know. One area of the investigation which does tend to tilt things a little more in Mark's direction is the reservoir. Authorities discuss using sonar to search the Montclair Reservoir for Susan's body, and that information came out around the same time that Lieutenant Commander Rogers discussed finding new evidence, which he hasn't yet disclosed publicly, but he felt assured them that a homicide had taken place. It doesn't take a lot of thought to make the connection that new evidence was found and then suddenly police want to search a reservoir located behind Mark's father's house. This doesn't necessarily mean that they consider him a possibility, but you have to admit, it's certainly suspicious. Perhaps this played a role in Mark's decision to not want to cooperate with the future of the investigation. Perhaps it's just a strange similarity. The one angle of Mark's possible involvement which made me struggle is how he would have managed to have pulled it off. For almost everyone who met Mark, they described him as quiet, unassuming, and fairly normal. He wasn't huge into the partying lifestyle like Susan was. He was more withdrawn, and once they were married and their son came along, he was even more so reserved. When they separated, Mark stayed nearby, but there weren't any reports of fights or disputes between the two even though Mark had been living downstairs from his estranged wife while she was dating other men. You'd imagine that could lead a person to want to do something, but as far as we know, Mark never did. The day Susan vanished, she left David with Mark. That means that from the last moment Susan was seen alive until the next day when Mark made the missing persons report, he had David with him. How would Mark have been able to have done something to Susan, disposed of her body in some way, gotten home in time to have been there when Melissa showed up looking for Susan and to have done all this while having David with him. Sure, he could have left David home alone, but during their investigation, police never got a hint from David that he was hiding anything or appeared as though he'd been frightened or threatened. The fact of the matter is, it isn't entirely impossible that Mark could have been involved, but all of the evidence seems to point away from him. Unless the Nutley police eventually released the evidence they found that made them want to look in the reservoir, there's absolutely nothing which implicates Mark Walsh in Susan's disappearance. From rumors about running away to suicide, from so-called vampires and Russian mafia associates to angry ex-boyfriends and an estranged husband, 
The list of possibilities of who could have been involved in Susan's disappearance are almost too many to count. Investigators walked into a missing person's case thinking they'd be able to track down the details and instead found themselves at the center of a complicated world populated by a cast of sordid characters. There was little to no evidence, hundreds of people to explore, and they were in a world where, for the most part, people don't want to give information to the police. They were nearly beaten from the get-go, and yet they managed to piece together as much of it as they could, all while being slandered and allegedly not caring about the case. Nearly 23 years have passed, and we have no more answers now than we did then. Susan has been missing since she was 36 years old, and if alive today, she'd be turning 59 next month. What became of the bright and beautiful blonde who captured readers' attention on the page and clients' eyes on the stage? What became of this troubled young mother who fought hard to overcome her demons, but may have ultimately been destroyed by them? What is this new evidence investigators possess, and why now, 13 years after they discovered it, are there still no answers? The vanishing of Susan Walsh is a deeply disturbing, incredibly overwhelming and comprehensive case for which the solution remains undiscovered. Unless police manage to break something with their evidence, someone comes forward with information, or Susan is found, alive or dead, the vanishing of Susan Walsh remains open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Susan Walsh, there are several forums and news articles discussing her case. Disappeared has run an episode on Susan, and the documentary Stripped has Susan as one of the main women depicted. If you have information about the vanishing of Susan Walsh, please contact the police department in Nutley, New Jersey, or the FBI. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. A special thank you goes out to Patreon producers Amanda Lee Ruth Smith, Krista Colvin, D'Earthy, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Kate Alexander, Megan Cotter, Tara Doble, and the Reigns of Yesteryear. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence. Visit trace-evidence.com for all episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. I want to thank you all for listening to this episode and remind you that if you're planning to attend CrimeCon, use promo code TRACE19 for 10% off a standard pass. I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.